grad, but now we're talking formally about grad and its applications. So, um, if you could please keep quiet. If you could please keep quiet. I'm waiting for you. The vector, please keep quiet, come on. X derivative, Y derivative. So if we take our two partial derivatives and we group them together in vector form, that's called grad F and is um, symbolically written as, I mean, if I read that aloud, I'd say grad F, but what I would draw is a triangle like that. It is also called the gradient of F, that's what grad is short for. Gradient, gradient of F or or del f okay because that's tri that's that triangle is called that symbol is called del okay so that that triangular symbol is called del and hence you could say del f but grad f is the um the sort of traditional name for that vector um if f of x y is differentiable then I gave that little formula um, yeah Let me write that on the next line. If f is differentiable, then the directional derivative is equal to that little formula for direction unit vector u equals a b. And so another way of writing that is as a dot product between grad f and u. Okay. Now, I don't believe I derived that for you. I, I didn't have the time. Um, we can show that if you take your first principles formula for the directional derivative and manipulate it um, in certain ways, you c that formula drops out. But it only drops out if f is differentiable. OK, so if f is differentiable, you're, there's a simple way of calculating your directional derivative. You don't have to use first principles. You can use that little formula. But here, we can show something rather magical. And this blows my mind every time. Even though I know it's true, it's astonishing that it is true. Um, so if we start off with this formula here, we can use the definition of the dot product to say, well, if big D is grad F dot U, then it means that it's equal to mod grad f mod u cos of theta, where theta is the angle between them. Between the two vectors grad f and u. Okay? That's the definition of the dot product. It forces us to think of that vector grad f as an arrow, which already is an interesting thing because that vector grad f is made up of a derivative, comma, and now the derivative. Okay? So there's the slopes. So it, it's not immediately obvious that you could think of those slopes as components of a vector. But if you choose to do so, if you choose to think of your two slopes as x and y components of a vector and actually draw that vector as an arrow, then you've got your arrow for grad f, you've got your arrow for u, which is your direction. There's an angle between them, and if you dot those two vectors, this is what you get. Okay, but the modulus of u is just what? It's just 1, because u is a unit vector. Oh, 
Okay, cool. So your directional derivative is the modulus of grad f times cos theta. So what does theta have to be if we want to maximize big D? This is maximized for when cos theta is 1. In other words, when theta equals 0. In other words, when the grad f arrow and the u arrow are actually pointing in the same direction. In other words, when u is in the same direction as grad f. So that's a rather wonky triangle there. Let me draw it again. And in addition, the maximum directional derivative, the, that maximum that we'd get if theta was zero, would just be mod grad f. Maximum directional derivative. And that all falls out of the definition of the dot product. I did not prove for you that that formula for directional derivative is valid. I gave it to you without proof and told you to trust me. You should always <coughs> worry when people just tell you to trust them. You should probably go check it out on the textbook or find some resource and justify that I'm not telling you dreadful lies. But I will tell you that I'm not telling you dreadful lies. It is, in fact, a legitimate formula for the directional derivative. And so we can write it as a dot product, and so we can use the definition of the dot product, and hence we can find out when it's going to be a maximum simply by thinking of values of theta. So what exactly does that mean? That means that if you're standing on the side of a mountain somewhere and it's some, some funny surface that you're standing on, if you work out your slope in the x direction, and you work out your slope in the y direction, and you take those two values, and you put them together, and you frame them as a vector, and then you think of that vector as an arrow, and you draw that arrow on the ground somewhere, and you face in that direction, you're facing in your direction, direction of maximum increase. You're facing the steepest slope. And the magnitude of that slope will be the magnitude of that arrow that you've just drawn in front of your feet. And that just, it just blows my mind that you can take two slopes that are orthogonal to one another, you can frame them as a vector, and that vector is actually meaningful in a geometric way. It gives you your direction of maximum increase, and the magnitude of that vector gives you your actual magnitude of your increase. Question? So the direction vector, is it a vector or a scalar if we're talking about it in magnitude? So the magnitude of the vector is a scalar, and it'll be your slope. It'll be a number like 2 or 3 or yeah, half. The modulus of grad f is the magnitude, and it's a number, it's a scalar. But grad f itself is a vector, it gives you a direction. Um, so, yeah, there's a picture that I want to draw. Do I actually want to wait? No, I don't want to wait. Um, so, let me draw a picture to kind of illustrate what this is talking about. Let's say I have some sort of paraboloid, say, some sort of hill, and I have contour lines on that hill. So those are kind of contour lines. Let's have Z over here, and Y over here, and X somewhere over there. I can draw those contour lines as level curves on my XY plane. Okay, so this is just a scruffy drawing. I'm just trying to give an indication of what this is describing. If I'm standing, let me draw a fourth one into my picture. Whee. <laughs> it's a very scruffy picture. Let's say I'm standing over there on this hillside. That dot over there would correspond, its projection onto the XY plane according to my drawing would be over there. Okay. Now think about this formula. This is going to be z equals f of x, y. So grad of f would be 
the vector that had an extra derivative in it and a y derivative in it. So it would be a two component vector. So if we were going to draw that vector as an arrow, we'd draw it on the right hand picture. Okay? So grad f would be drawn on here. Let's say this is x naught, y naught, z naught. This would be grad, this vector over here would be grad f at x naught, y naught. Is that clear? It's not very clear. I'm going to write that exact same information on. There's nothing wrong with that information. I'm just going to write it in a different place so it's a little bit more readable. Ah, no, I didn't want my purple circle to go away. Come back, purple circle. Oh, you were the most important purple circle. Ah, not black. Purple. There we go. Now back to black. There we are. Okay, and that... That arrow over there is my grad f evaluated at x naught y naught. So at a point on the surface where that surface is described as z equals some function of x and y, I can work out my x derivative, I can work out my y derivative, I can evaluate those derivatives at that particular point. Okay, and those are giving me my slopes. If I was standing at that point, they would give me my slopes if I move parallel to the x-axis and my slope if I move parallel to y-axis. But what I'll do is I'll take those two slopes, I'll group them together in a vector, a two-component vector, and hence drawable on the two-dimensional picture, on the <coughs> x-y level curve picture, and I'll get an arrow. And that arrow will point most steeply uphill. It'll give me the direction of steepness, of greatest steepness. And the magnitude of that arrow will give me exactly how steep it is. Short arrow, not particularly steep. Long arrow, quite steep. And as I say, this, I find this amazing. It's, it's, it's a really simple little thing. I mean, it's just that dot product story at the top. But I think it's, it's really quite a profound application of partial differentiation that those two derivatives, which don't seem to have anything to do with vectors, can give you direction of maximum increase. Is there anything else I want to say before I jump into an example? No. I'm going to do an example now, but any questions before I do? Okay, so you, so you have your slope, you have your surface, which is expressed as z equals, okay, not all surfaces can be. But assuming that we have our surface z equals some function of x and y, because the function is in terms of x and y, it means we can work out an x derivative and a y derivative. So that's two derivatives. If we choose to then group those two derivatives together into a vector and interpret that vector, it's a two-component vector and hence we'll draw it on a two-dimensional <coughs> plane. We wouldn't draw it onto the 3D picture. We'd draw it onto the 2D picture. Because it's a two-component vector, got a change in x and a change in y and ignore z. Um, we, what th that little dot product story at the top of the screen there tells us that the way we can interpret that vector is direction of maximum increase because if our u points in the same direction as our f, if we choose to go, if we choose to determine our directional derivative in the direction that's the same as that black arrow, it'll give us maximum directional derivative because the theta will be zero. The angle between them will be zero, between the u and the grad f. So our grad f gives us our direction of maximum increase. And again, falling out of that dot product story at the top, the modulus of grad f gives me my actual magnitude of increase. So it gives me my steepness. <coughs> if you were wanting to work out which direction is greatest downward slope, you'd simply take the exact 180 degrees. Because if I'm standing on a mountainside and this is the direction towards the top of the mountain, as long as my slope is differentiable, which it has to be, if I simply turn my back on that direction, that'll give me my steepest downward. If you're thinking of a situation where that's not the case, then you're thinking of a function where the point where I'm standing is not differentiable. Question? Um, is this the same as like gradients in 3D <coughs> where like a gradient of one would be sort of 45 degrees? The, the, the same? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if, if grad F turned out to be 1, it would mean that for every one step you took forward, you'd be taking one step upward. So yes, it would still be a 45 degree slope. Question over there? Uh, 
I don't get how you, you choose your direction in a vector. Like, how do you know that in that direction you get your maximum? Because if I choose, so that arrow that I've drawn there is my grad F arrow. <laughs> If I'm standing at that dot and I want to move in some direction and I want to work out the slope in that direction, I'd do a directional derivative calculation and I would define my u, my unit vector, to, in, to describe the direction I'm wanting to go in. And this definition here at the top of the page, at the top of the screen, says that the slope in this direction I choose, and there's infinitely many directions I can choose, my slope is going to be grad f dot u, which is mod f mod u cos theta, which is mod grad f cos theta, which is maximized when theta is zero. Theta equals zero, what does that mean on my picture? On my picture it means u is actually sitting on top of my black arrow. It's sitting in the same direction as grad f. So I can interpret my grad F vector as direction of maximum increase. Which is, I think, is pretty astonishing. It, it amazes me, I, it constantly amazes me that that's true, but it is. Okay, I'm gonna demonstrate with an example with number 121. <laughs> Okay, you've got a function, x squared minus y squared plus 3, please keep quiet. A nice differentiable function which makes a pleasant change from those other ones we've been dealing with recently. It is, it's a multi-part question. It first says sketch the level curves for the function. So I'm going to um, go quite fast through the first bit because you should be quite familiar with <coughs> level curves. <coughs> Okay. And this, I think, might be, was this the very first level curves we ever did, actually? Pretty much. If you go back to exercise 3A, you'll see the same thing, except the only difference is here we've got that plus 3, and we didn't over there. So this is exactly like the first level curves we ever did, where we've got hyperbolas. If k is larger than 3, we've got, okay, if k equals 3, we're going to have x squared minus y squared equals 0. In other words, x equals y or x <coughs> equals minus y. We'll get those crisscross lines. And those crisscross lines will be the asymptotes of the hyperbolas, where we'll get these left-right hyperbolas if, x, if k is greater than 3. Oh, word goodness. Those are some of the squiffest hyperbolas I've ever drawn. Ever drawn? Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I challenge you to draw better hyperbolas than me. Here we go. <coughs> I think someone would look at that and would charitably assume I was trying to draw hyperbolas. So there we go. These are the k greater than 3 ones, these are the k smaller than 3 ones, and the crisscross of the k equal to 3. Those are not the world's best level curves. I'm not going to go to a lot of effort to put detail in. If this were a test or exam question, put some detail in. Number several of those curves with their k values and put in the x or y intercepts of at least one set of curves. All right. But I'm not going to go to all that trouble right now. Use these level curves to sketch the graph of the function while well, you're familiar enough with surfaces and level curves to know that that'll be a hyperbolic paraboloid. <coughs> uh, let's have a look. Um, it'll look like that. It'll look like that. You know what? I'm going to draw the hyperbolic paraboloid first and I'll put the axes in afterwards. That's easier. No, that's not right, that's not right. What I want is, I'm wanting happy parabolas this way. Let's no, that's also not right, should be. No, no, these are hard. Hyperbolic paraboloids are hard. Here we go, let's try again.
Something like that? Okay, I'm not going to belabor it. Could be better, but it's good enough. Well, because um, I'm trying to draw it, um, happy parabolas if you look at the ZX profile, but sad ones if you look at the ZY profile. Because I can see that, am I wrong? That's my attempt. That's my attempt. I give myself three out of five for my attempt. Um, it does come across as a hyperbolic paraboloid. Um, yeah. Ooh, um, bit of a digression, but just what I'm thinking of it, let me say it. Um, people have been asking me what's the syllabus for the test. I found out from the mainstream lecturers yesterday. It is up to directional derivatives. I'm not sure that it even includes grad. I'll, I'll clear that up, but it's certainly up to yesterday's lecture. Might include grad. So at a push it includes today's lecture, but I, I, don't, I don't get to make that call, I'm afraid. <laughs> So I'll just tell them, we had a vote in class and we decided no grad. Hope that's okay with you. <laughs> but it certainly doesn't include double integrals, which we will be starting shortly. Question? Please keep quiet. Please keep quiet. Please keep quiet. If I said y equal to zero, I'll have parabolas that look like that. And if I said x equal to zero, I'll have parabolas that look like that. So I've tried to get that sense of curvature into my surface picture, where if I, if I look down the y-axis at the xz plane, I'm seeing a smiley face. Whereas if I'm looking down the x-axis, uh, x-axis at the y-z plane, I'm seeing sad face. So that that's the sort of sense I'm trying to get across there. But is that right? You don't think so? Um, gosh. Okay. Grave doubt amongst class. as to veracity of this diagram. Right, I have recorded your concerns. Let's move on. Question. How? I beg your pardon? How? I haven't. Sorry, did I, write, did I mess up in my thing? No, okay. Above three gives you um, gives you the left right hyperbolas, and k smaller than three gives you the uh, top bottom hyperbolas, which on the surface picture correspond. If I slice my saddle higher than that um, point of inflection over there, I will get I will I will be getting hyperbolas that are coming essentially coming out of the screen towards me and behind the back. Whereas if I slice low down, I'll be, I'll be chopping these bits and I'll be getting hyperbolas that are like this along the y-axis and hence corresponding <coughs> to the top bottom lines. Now, it might not be the world's most beautiful picture, but I think technically it is correct. Yes. <coughs> I can't hear you. Yes, K always represents Z in level curves. Because if you look at your original... Z is not always above three. Z is below three for the bits that scoop down like this. Yes, that carries on. Yes, 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 yes. One always draws one's surfaces with edges. Otherwise, you just shade in the whole page because they go on forever. So one always draws one's surfaces with edges, but it's it's a fake thing to trick the eye into what it is that you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. And I haven't given it much of a curve, so it's not that that curve. Okay. All right. Let's stop critiquing Tracy's drawing and move on with the matter. Don't worry. You're not going to give me an inferiority complex to do with my drawing. I came to grips with that some time ago. In what direction from the point one, two? Okay. All right. So here's the important bit, the bit that's actually to do with what we're doing today in class. First of all, I'm going to figure out what k value corresponds to the point 1, 2. Okay, I'm running out of page here. 
I'm going to come back to this drawing, but I'm just going down a page to do some calculations. Z equals x squared minus y squared plus 3. Mm, it's 1, 2. 1, 2. That gives me z equals... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. I'm getting confused. Z equals 0. In other words, corresponding to k equals 0. Let me go back up to my picture. K equals zero, zero is smaller than three. It'll be one of those top bottom hyperbolas. I'm going to choose one, one, two. Um, let me just set that to the K equals zero hyperbola. That's the point one, two. I'm not gonna write it into the picture yet because I'm not sure what other detail I'm putting in yet. Okay, let's work out what does it say. In what direction from the point one, two, does the function increase most, ra most rapidly indicate this direction on the sketch you made in A? Now I can tell you, if I have any control over a question in a test or an exam that involves grad, and I cannot promise that I will have any control, but if I do, it'll be a question like that. I will want you to show grad in a picture. Because what's the point of just calculating it and shoving symbols around on the page? You've got to understand what it means. So if I have control, which is quite a small if, it'll be a question like that. But it is quite a small if, so don't go putting all your eggs in that basket. Um, so let's work out grad f. Where was I? Where was I? Where was I? Um, grad f, the x derivative, comma, the y derivative. Grad f evaluated at 1, 2. It'll be 2 minus 4. Let's think about what that looks like as an arrow. Please keep quiet. What does that look like if I drew it as an arrow? It's an arrow that, if I drew it on, let's have a look. If back in first year somebody told you draw that as a vector, draw it as an arrow, you might have drawn it like that. Okay, where this is 2 and this is minus 4. But of course, arrows, vectors, arrow vectors, have magnitude and they have direction, but they're not fixed in space. So that vector and this vector and this vector and this vector, they're all exactly the same vector, as long as they have exactly the same length and exactly the same sort of direction and orientation. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one of those arrows and we're going to draw it onto our level curves picture with the base of the arrow on that dot. Question? Where did you get 2x and minus 2y? This is the x derivative. And this is the y derivative. <laughs> where my function is x squared minus y squared plus 3. So it's the two derivatives. Cool. Thanks for asking that. Okay, so the x derivative and the y derivative, and then I evaluate them at my point, and I get this 2 minus 4. Now that I know what that arrow looks like, I'll go back to my level curve picture, and I will try to draw that same arrow onto my picture, and it'll look something like that. There we go. And that's my point 1, 2. And that's the arrow grad f 1, 2. And that gives me my direction of maximum increase. If I drew it accurately, it would probably be quite a long arrow. It's probably quite steep. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, if you draw it, if you draw all those curves and everything accurately, I'm just looking at my notes where I did it on computer. It's actually a very long arrow. It goes way into the fourth quadrant if you draw it accurately. <coughs> okay. Yes. Question. Um, what would happen if we had something? Say, like, say for instance, you've got two directions that have the same mental increase. Like, um, so, I mean, where you could point, you could point up the, uh, I think it's the y axis and down the y axis, and you'd be increasing in both directions at the same rate. Yeah, well, if you, if you put in your, if you follow this method, if you forget, if you, if you evaluate a grad f at the origin, you just get the vector 0, 0, which we would not be able to draw as an arrow. 
which I think geometrically we could interpret as there's no one direction of maximum increase. Yeah, because your zero vector is orthogonal to all other vectors. Yeah. Okay, but there was something else, wasn't there? Oh, it says, in which directions from the point 1, 2 does the function remain constant? Okay, this is slightly tricky. Because basically the question is saying, what direction do you need to go in order to stay on your level curve? Okay. So, let me, again, let me go back to the picture. There mm, we go. Now, I'm about to do, I'm about, yeah, I do have time. After finishing this example, I'm going to go on to uh, showing you that your gradient vector doesn't just point in your direction of maximum increase. It's actually <laughs> orthogonal to your level curve, <coughs> which I haven't shown yet but is a useful thing to know in order to answer 121D. So basically, in order to remain on your level curve, which is another way of saying F remains constant, we would want to go, let me actually choose a different color here, I'm going to choose red, in one of those red directions. Okay. I'm just going to write here D, because it's part of question D. <coughs> and straight after the example, I will go, ahe I will go ahead with some uh, derivations or some proof, I suppose, to show you that what I'm saying is true. Let me write here. In order for F to remain constant, we want to remain on the level curve. That is we want a direction orthogonal, which is not clear yet. So why should direction of maximum increase necessarily be orthogonal? Does I mean yeah, okay, but is that always the case? Turns out it is always the case. We want a direction orthogonal to grad F. Okay, and you can just do that by inspection. You can just do it by eyeballing it. If grad F is the vector, what was it? 2 minus 4. Then such a vector is, and then you just make it up. You think, hmm, I want something that when I dot it with 2 <coughs> minus 4 is going to give me 0. How about 4, 2? Because that will give me 8 minus 8. Ow. But there are infinitely many such vectors. Or 2, 1 or minus 4, minus 2, or, and there are infinitely many, but what you'll find is those infinitely many vectors are all parallel to one another, and hence are scalar multiples of one another. Did I see a hand over there somewhere? No, I thought I did. Okay, so you just do it by inspection, which means looking at it and going, um, until the answer comes to you. <laughs> yes. I beg your pardon? Sorry, I made them laugh and now I can't hear you. I, well, I saw that mostly because um, <coughs> if you want to come up with a vector that starts with a known vector to give you zero, zero, the easiest way to do that is to do a little multiplication where, well, notice that's a two, well, if you just look at the magnitudes, that's a two and that's a four, and I just swap them, four and two. And then you just need to make sure that the signs make sense. So if I times the two with the four, and I times the four with the two, they'll both be eight, so I just need to make sure that the signs make sense. So, just make something up. Make, you can do a whole thing of going, let the components be A, B, such, that, and then you can start doing all sorts of equations. But if you just eyeball it, you can just make something up. Question? Thank you. That question segues into exactly what I want to write next. The question was, why is it only remaining constant if you go orthogonal? And it's because your gradient vector is always orthogonal to your level curve, which I'm about to prove. So that was a perfect segue. Any questions before I move on? No? Cool. Let me move on. Gosh. It's like I planted you in the audience. 
<laughs> yes. Uh, over there, and then who was first? You? Yes, but it's the point one two. So they've given me the co uh, the coordinates. They've given me the coordinates. I know it's in the first quadrant. Quite right. Quite right. There will be two level curves where k equals zero. Yeah. So the point um, what minus one minus two would that be the sort of twin? And, but you're quite right. There are two curves, but I but I have the actual coordinates. So I know where it belongs. Um, so if the point had actually been given was m negative 1, negative 2, then the dot would have been down here in the third quadrant. My grad f would still have been 2x minus 2y, and so my grad f would have been minus 2 plus 4, and minus 2 plus 4 would have been pointing that way. And so I would have in fact had an arrow the exact opposite of that one. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but, but basically, you are standing on a hillside at that dot. And you want to know that if you're standing at that dot, which direction must you go for maximum increase? So that's why you're drawing the arrow there, because it's specific to that point. Because you put in the point 1, 2 into your grad. Does that make sense? Yes, that vector is the same vector no matter where you put it. But it's only direction of maximum increase for that dot. So seeing as you're trying to use that vector to indicate a direction of maximum increase, it's only direction, direction of maximum increase for that dot. But um, Michael, you had a question, and then I have to move on. I've got to get this finished, this lecture. Mr. Dupree, do you have a question? No, right, I'm moving on. OK, orthogonality of grad f. If z equals f of xy is a function of two variables, then f of x, y equals k is a level curve. So far, so good. Sorry, my handwriting is deteriorating because I'm going fast. Level curve of f. <coughs> Please keep quiet. We can call the level curve c, because why not? And it's a curve, so we can express it parametrically. As r of t equals x of t, y of t, z is just zero in this case because it's a level curve, so z is zero. Yeah, if we draw it as a level curve flat on the xy plane, yes. Not if we think of it as a contour actually on the surface of the of the surface, sorry, on the surface. Um, let's have a look. So f of x, y equals k and <coughs> r of t describe the same curve. They're just different ways of writing it. Curve. Therefore, we could write our function like that. Why would we want to? Why we, we, we would want to is because we're about to use chain rule on that thing. We're about to, <gasps> yeah, everybody's favorite, yay. Although I still haven't watched that YouTube video that somebody posted on the um, Padlet. <coughs> Sorry, I've just been crazy busy. Um, but I understand that it's very useful. So um, yeah, so if you look on the Padlet, there's a link to a YouTube video that explains chain rule apparently in a marvelous way that's uh, less formula intensive. Um, 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 where am I? Let P of X naught, Y naught be a point on C corresponding <coughs> to the parameter value T equals T naught. Because you see, by writing f of x of t, 
f is explicitly a function of x and y, but it's implicitly a function of t. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to differentiate both sides with respect to t. If we have f of x of t, y of t equals k, then it follows that df by dx, dx by dt, plus df by dy, dy by dt, equals the derivative of k, which is 0. Okay? That's a dot product between df by dx, df by dy, dotted with dx by dt, dy by dt. Okay? And that first vector is just grad f. And the second vector is r dash of t. Okay, now that's generically, but in specifically, in particular, at P, <coughs> grad F at X naught, Y naught, dotted with R dash at T naught, equals zero. Okay, so what this says is that your gradient vector is orthogonal to your tangent vector. This says that the gradient vector at P is orthogonal, I'm just going to put the orthogonal symbol there, to the tangent vector. So if I were going to draw some picture, here we go, here's my level curve that I'm calling C. Let's say I've got some points on that level curve over here. What are we hearing? Um, there's my grad F. And there's my r dash of t. <coughs> OK. So your, gra your gradient vector is always orthogonal to your level curve. More specifically, it's orthogonal to your, gra your tangent vector at that point. OK. So your grad f vector tells you a lot. It tells you an awful lot. It's a really very useful, very informative vector. <coughs> and the time is 43 minutes past the hour. And I want to... What do I want to do? Oh, I want to talk about tangent planes. Tell you what. Sorry? Two examples. It's two minutes. Whoop, whoop. I can just whip them up. Um, no, because I want to talk about tangent planes a little bit and talk about level surfaces. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop there. Tomorrow morning I'm going to get you to warm up a little by doing maybe 122 or maybe 123. And then I'm going to take this discussion of orthogonality. I'm going to step it up a dimension. So instead of dealing with level curves, we're dealing with level surfaces. And we're going to use grad to get the normals to tangent planes. Okay.